You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Do you believe it? Sports and culture combined into one. Michael on the drive across the lane. Turnaround shot. Got it. 63 for Jordan. Are you kidding me? He did what? The Daily BS begins. Bazinga. <laughs> right now. Hey, googly moogly. Hadouken. Hey, this promises to be fun. Can't wait. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, folks. Brian Snow is here and with you, and we're ready to get down to some daily BS business, sports and culture combined into one. You can hear a replay of this show one hour after its completion, and the premiere of the Daily BS podcast will also be available one hour after this show's completion. We are on all kinds of networks and stations all across the country. Well, let me use my normal phrase in the region, across the nation and around the world. So if you're in your car on the drive home and you got me via your phone, via your laptop, via whatever, welcome to the Daily BS and let old Brian take you home with some great sports and culture talk. All right. Enough introductions. Let's get started. So I kind of heard something that, you know, Ar- Arsenio Hall had a segment that said things that make you go, hmm, or to borrow from that, I heard something that made me go, what? I feel like Joe Beningo, what? What I heard was when the NBA does return, they plan on starting with the playoffs. What? the hell is wrong with you you're gonna go right to the playoffs when a very dangerous situation let's not make light of it eventually uh, essentially killed a big part of the season you're gonna miss the playoff push you're gonna miss the teams that are fighting even harder than ever to stay in the playoff hunt all kinds of stuff you can't do anything about that but you can be smart about it and say why don't we give these players about 10 games that's all let's give them about 10 games to get their legs under them to get used to their teammates again to get used to the atmosphere again the arenas because everything's closed everything has been postponed Workouts, everything, uh, uh, practice facilities closed, everything in the NBA shut down until this coronavirus pandemic passes or ends. Hopefully the latter and not the former. If you are in your home right now and you're listening to this show, A, thank you, and B, continue to take care of yourself. But let's just give them 10 games, okay? And something else that I heard on first take God, don't ask me why I I, I actually watched that show recently. You know, being home, not being able to go to work and all. Don't, look, don't ask me why First Take was in my ears and in my eyes. That show makes me hurt. But a very valid point was brought up during First Take. And it's a point that has basically brought the sports world to a halt money a nugget of information that i was given the magic number is 70 and no i'm not talking about wins in a season i'm talking about games being played according to a few sources and according to what the folks said on first take and with my producer shane lake who was researching this for me 70 games is the magic number for all the teams to get the local broadcast money, the local television money. Well, some of these teams haven't played 70 games yet. So if you bring them back and give them 10 games and give them the chance to get everything under them, to get all of their faculties together, then... Not only do you get that money, but 
you know, you, you have a good lead into the playoffs because this is the cynical part of me. The TV stations are hoping the season is canceled so they don't have to pay out that money. If it's a chance for them to keep the money, <laughs> yeah, they're going to try to keep it. But at the same time, you got a lot of players itching, itching to get back on the floor. But you want to do it safely. Let's just be real. You want to do it safely. You want to make sure the players are in a safe spot, a comfortable spot, and a good spot where they can get back on the floor and resume their playing careers. But 70 games is the target for all of the teams to get the local television money. You know how much that you know what that means to all of the small markets like Milwaukee, like Oklahoma City, God forgive me for saying that. It means a lot. It means an infusion to the NBA. It means one hell of an infusion of cash to the NBA. So not only am I hoping that basketball comes back so I can see the Lakers fail to win the championship. Oh, did I say that aloud? I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm kidding as I say that. But, you know, have everything in a good spot also. Have everything in a good spot and give them the 10 games to get themselves together. The 10 games are going to be very important to say the least. Again, physically, it allows them to get their legs under them. It allows them to get used to the floor again, because this is a long layoff. This is an absolute long layoff. Okay. So whenever they do get it together, Let's get them in the same, let's get them, if we can't get them in the same speed or close to it that they were before everything shut down, then let's get them to a good spot where they can pick everything back up and try to make it better. Let's just do that. But I say 10 games is going to be very important for the players to get themselves back together. So I had a conversation with a bronze sexual again, and <laughs> people are going, why are you, why do you keep talking to these people? I mean, you've already destroyed most of their claims. Well, <laughs> well, I didn't start this one. Half of them I do start, but that's another story. I didn't start this one. This came to me. I mean, do you ever have something that you try to avoid and it just falls right in your lap and you just have to pick it apart? I believe the old movie line goes something that's to the tune of just when I think I got out They bring me right back in. Yeah, I'm right back in again. So, to the original opening, I had a conversation with a bronze sexual. And his statement to me was, I can't believe the NBA has shut down and it's going to cost LeBron James an MVP and a championship. Let me repeat that. This bronze sexual said to me that this NBA shutdown or postponement is going to cost their beloved LeBron James an MVP title and a championship. Remember, this is a bronze sexual I'm dealing with, folks. And my response, very eloquently, y'all know me, I don't get excited. I don't go completely off unless I'm provoked. And I was provoked. So I said to this bronze sexual, 
Are you bleeping kidding me? Except for one statistical category, LeBron does not lead his team in anything. Let me say that again. Except for one statistical category, which is assists, in which he leads the NBA, that'll change. He doesn't lead his team in anything. Why they're considering LeBron James as an MVP candidate is beyond me. Because the front runner is Giannis Antetokounmpo of the Milwaukee Bucks. You know who should be in the second spot as contender for NBA Most Valuable Player? There's a fellow by the name of Anthony Davis who's on a one-year rental with the Los Angeles Lakers. I said it. I mean it. I'm sticking with it until I'm shown otherwise. But as I said, there's a fellow by the name of Anthony Davis who's on a one-year rental with the Lakers, and then he's going to go home next year. That leads his team, save assists in every statistical category, and has made three times more big shots during this season than LeBron James has. He's got a little more basketball smarts than LeBron. Yes, he has not played a full season since he's been in the NBA. That was my knock against him was his health. But I had a chance to see Anthony Davis play in Chicago, and I knew he was going to be a good one. What hurts me about Anthony Davis is that he play, he didn't play more than one year at Kentucky. You know how dominant he could have been and how many records he could have broken had he stayed? That's a discussion for another time. But why isn't Anthony Davis in the MVP conversation? Why isn't Anthony Davis given the same kind of hype, given the same kind of pub, and everybody's saying, oh, LeBron James and Anthony Davis? It should be Anthony Davis and LeBron James. LeBron James is playing second fiddle. Oh, I'm going to go all the way there. LeBron James doesn't is not a leader on his team. Anthony Davis is. Anthony Davis is actually playing basketball. Anthony Davis is actually, for the most part, fundamentally sound. Anthony Davis has something LeBron James hasn't had in 17 years. It's called a post game, folks. I mean, yeah, he takes a lot of three-point shots, and I wish he wouldn't. But at the same time, I'm giving credit where credit's due. Anthony Davis is a baller. End of story. Now, if Anthony Davis learned how to make some free throws, and if LeBron James learned how to make some free throws, then maybe, just maybe, I can give the Los Angeles Lakers a little bit more credit than I'm giving them now. And when the NBA does resume, I still say the Lakers will fall short of a title. They'll get eliminated in the second round for the reasons I posted already. They can't make their free throws. LeBron's a big part of that problem. And secondly, they're not fundamentally sound. They're not fundamentally together. And they haven't been all season. But at the same time, again, give credit where credit is due. Anthony Davis should be in the MVP conversation. Matter of fact, the race should be Giannis Antetokounmpo and Anthony Davis, not Giannis and LeBron. What the hell has LeBron done this year? Not a doggone thing. Not a doggone thing. And while I'm taking a shot at LeBron, which I often do on this program, let me point this out. Someone said to me, or uh, uh, I, I take that back. Let me be let me be factually correct. On a post that I read Friday night before I actually fell asleep, I read that LeBron, someone foolishly, foolishly said that LeBron in the 90s would average 35 points. 10 rebounds, and about 10 assists. What? What the hell are you thinking? 35, 10, and 10 in the 90s when they actually played defense, when they actually were physical, when they actually gave a damn about the game? Not saying they don't now, but you can see it a lot better in the 80s and the 90s than you see it now. LeBron in that era would not survive. He just would not survive. Because to me, and this is only one man's opinion that is shared by a few others that grew up with me. And I hate to say this to you, bronze sexuals. And I know this ain't a bronze sexual confession. I'll have that later in the week. But I hate to say this to you guys. But LeBron does not have the nerve to lead his team. He just doesn't have it. 
He played many years in Cleveland when the East was weak. And when he played a good team, and this has been the Lakers' problem, this has been the Rockets' problem, this has been problems with teams that feast on, 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 on inferior teams. On inferior teams, he feasts. On a team that's slightly better than him, Denver Nuggets, Utah Jazz, he famines. Anthony Davis had to ride to the rescue in that game before the All-Star break where the Lakers went overtime. And they had no business going overtime with the Denver Nuggets. None. No business whatsoever. So before you put LeBron James in the MVP conversation, why don't you put Anthony Davis in the MVP conversation? And why don't you do it the year after when he's at home with the Chicago Bulls leading them to the World Championship Series? Oh, did I just put that out there? Oh, well. Pause for a timeout. Got more stuff for you. Snowman in the morning, back in a flash. tuned in to the daily bs sports and culture combined into one you want to know something crazy folks ever since i moved from indiana to north carolina with my family i've met some great great people and last week i had miles clark on who was a former eagle north carolina central and now i have his teammate on say hello to charles whitfield he joins me now on the other side of the hotline. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing terrific. It's it's great to meet you, and it's great to talk to you. My pleasure. It's uh, my total pleasure. And anybody that is a friend of my teammate, Miles Clark, is a, now a friend of mine, and my pleasure to join you uh, on your radio show. I really appreciate it. What was it like with you and Miles playing at uh, North Carolina Central. And this is back in the 80s when you guys were in Division Two, before you guys made the jump to D1. Exactly. Now, it was, it, was a, it was a beautiful thing. Miles is a couple years older than myself, so he was like a big brother to me. And when I first came in as a freshman uh, at North Carolina Central, I played basketball in Greensboro, at Greensboro Page High School. And um, 
once I got to Central, you know, as you are in high school when you're the man and or one of the men on your team, when you get to college, you're back with the low man on the total pole again. And as a freshman, that's exactly where I was. And I had a couple guys like Miles, a couple other teammates. One of my one of our teammates is a brother named Cleo Hill, uh, Jr., who's now the head coach at Winston-Salem State. Um, so he was another one of my big brothers and another brother named Wayne Howell, who, you know, all three of those guys kind of almost adopted me as their little brother. And um, and the experience was great. And to be able to be in practice and, and learn from those guys. And the beautiful thing is after college, um, you know, I graduated in college in 1991 and it's now 2020. But the beautiful thing is we're all still connected and we're still friends. You know, all of my teammates, we share a group text with about 20 of us. And every day, one of our teammates who uh, now is a minister sends us, sends us out of scripture every day. And, you know, we're able to just communicate with each other. So whether, you know, unfortunately, we've had a couple of teammates who passed away over the years. But when someone has a birthday or when something good happens in each other's lives, with the simple click of a text, you know, we're able to stay looped in. And Miles was always great um, on the court. He was he was a great basketball player. He was a great leader, but he was a great person. And the beautiful thing is, you know, with what we're going through now um, with this, you know, coronavirus pandemic, you know, everyone has nothing but time. And through it, um, you're able to stay connected or reconnect with new friends such as yourself. And it's been absolutely great to connect with you, to connect with Miles Clark and everyone I've had a chance to uh, connect with. You were not only a basketball player, but you were also into music, which led to you getting into radio. And I read in your bio while folks were getting into Cool Mo D and those guys, you were into George Benson. Exactly. I grew up, I grew up listening to jazz with the older brother. Um, I'm 50 years old of, you know, if I can make it two more days, <laughs> I'll be 51. I'll be 51. Um, celebrate my birthday on March the 30th, but I have an older brother who's 10 years older than me, who, as most people know, if you have a brother or older sibling, you want to hang out with them. And that was my, my, my dream was to just hang out and ride with him. And as I would ride around town with him, with us having a 10 year age gap, I was listening to, a lot of jazz that he listened to, whether it was David Sanborn, whether it was George Benson, whether it was Miles Davis. Um, and don't get me wrong, you also listen to a lot of early, you know, a lot of R&B. This was in the, the, the late 70s, early 80s. So whether it was um, SOS Band or, or Michael Jackson or Prince. So I really, you know, credit a lot of, you know, my music knowledge to my brother because at the time I didn't know it, but I was actually – you know, riding around listening to music with him and which would eventually turn into a job, not only working in radio, but prior to me working in radio, I actually helped start a record label called Hidden Beach Records that actually Jill Scott was the first artist that I worked with that actually through my brother and a, a close family friend being Michael Jordan, he actually became the majority investor in Hidden Beach. So at the end of the wow. day, through relationships was um, how... I end up getting my job in the music business and have been in it um, 25 plus years and blessed to be in a business um, doing something I truly love every day. And But through sports, a lot of relationships I met through sports, between sports and entertainment, as we all know, you know, all entertainers want to be tied into sports and, and all sports athletes want to be tied in with musicians. True. And so the, be- the beautiful thing is I've been blessed through a lot of close relationships to be blessed to, to have my foot in both. And it's nothing that I ever take for granted. And it's a blessing. And, and I try and touch as many young people as I can to help pass down some of the knowledge and wisdom I've received over the years through some of my mentors. And oh. to me, it's all about paying it forward. Yeah, it is. And I try to do the same with uh, my radio show and uh, my media company, Snowman Digital Media, that I just uh, started at the top of this year. And, and you okay, just mentioned congratulations on that. Thank you. And you just mentioned uh, uh, you just mentioned the player who I watched the most, which is Michael Jordan. And before him, it was Julia serving. And yep. here here is where I differ from a lot of folks that I uh, I talk to today in terms of basketball. When they ask me who my favorite player is and I say Michael Jordan without blinking at the same time, I'm not oblivious to the folks who paved the way 
for Michael Jordan, like a Julia Serving, like a Magic Johnson, like a Larry Bird. Hell, one of my favorite point guards played with Philadelphia, and that was Maurice Cheeks, a Maurice fellow Chicagoan. Cheeks. Nope, I'm, I I grew up um as I mean we're without even knowing your age, we sound like we're in the same generation. <laughs> and the one thing I can tell you, I met Michael when I was 15, and wow. I'm 50, soon to be 51, and he's like another big brother to me. And as I tell people, um, my, we actually met him when he was in high school. My brother used to be an assistant coach at a small school in North Carolina called Campbell University. Yeah. And they had, they used to have a pretty prestigious basketball camp. And mm-hmm. my brother was working on his master's degree. He played at Campbell, but he was a grad assistant. And when Michael was in high school, um, Michael came and, and played with a lot of the ACC players who used to come down and play. And that's where we first met him. And he and my brother just got a click and got a bond and stayed connected. And as I tell people, um, you know, they are, how close are he and Michael really are? You know, one, they've been in business 25, 30 years. My brother, is fortunately, is the president of the Charlotte Hornets. But when Michael's dad passed away, my brother and a few of Michael's close friends were Paul Bears. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's all you need to know right. what that relationship is Absolutely. about. So not only how they do business together where, you know, my brother helps oversee all of the business side of the Charlotte Hornets, Michael's family. And so at the end of the day, when I've been around and, but to your point, Michael paid homage to a lot of the guys like a Dr. J guys like Larry Bird and, and, and magic who were there before him. But also he was one that paid it forward. And yes. unfortunately with what's happened with um, the recent passing of Kobe Bryant, Kobe was a, a little brother to Michael. And he if was. you looked at how Kobe played his game on the court um, and his tenacity and even what he started doing off the court, a lot of what he did was the, was what he learned in, in, in from Michael. And, mm-hmm. you know, they were really, really close. And, you know, anyone who saw Kobe's memorial service and saw that genuine emotion from MJ, that was real because he truly did lose someone that was a little brother to him. And at the end of the day, but he also – always made you know made homage to all those that were before him the magics the birds the bobby joneses of the world Moses yes. Malone, george gervin michael was a true um historian of the game and mm-hmm. that's why i've been blessed to be around him and, and sometimes just sit and have real basketball conversations with one of the best and to your point when anybody asks me who's the best player that i saw play it's mj like you period. without question period but I wasn't around when I wasn't around when Wilt Chamberlain played or right. Bill Russell. You know, right. I, I would see or um, you know all of the old greats, Clyde Frazier. But I'm a historian of the game. Mm-hmm. But to now see how you know I have an eight year old daughter who goes with me to all the Hornets games, and you know she first met MJ watching Space Jam. Nice. <laughs> <And so laughs> at, the, at the end of the day, you know her contemporaries are LeBron. You know, mm-hmm. are the players, are Dwayne Wade. And, you know, the funny thing is her favorite player right now is Kobe White. And so <laughs> at the end, I know she's truly my daughter because, you know, she's picking up the game um, because she's, you know, basically grown up going to Hornets games or Bobcats games when she was born. Right. But she grew up in the arena with me. And so literally it's nothing better than – seeing your kid and 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 fortunately you know i didn't have a son because if i had a son i'm sure i'd be wanting to play aau (laughs) but having a daughter (laughs) and seeing my daughter that's me and her date night is going with me to hornets games and my wife is totally content not that she doesn't like basketball but she knows that's a good time that and what's crazy what we've been dealing with with this um coronavirus literally you know you can sit there at, at nba tv and watch old classic games and so, but, you know, my daughter will go on YouTube and she knows how to go on and find some classic MJ games to look at. And so I'm truly, you know, I'm like, you're definitely my daughter. Because at the <laughs> end, basketball, you know, one, teaches you a lot about business, it teaches you a lot about life, and teaches you a lot about relationships. And that's the one thing, you know, even how we connected through my teammate, Miles Clark, when you reached out to me and was like, hey, I met you, uh, the first first email you sent me was, hey, your teammate Miles Clark told me to reach out to you. And to me, I knew you were good just once on, on the premise that you and Miles had connected. And yep. at the end of the day, that's the one thing that sports can do. It continues, it continually connects dots for you. 
you know, Miles and I have not played basketball with Central. I graduated in 1991. <laughs> you know, we have not, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. guess what? We're still, we're still connected. Yeah, it was a few years that we lost contact, as, as a lot of people do. But yeah. the beautiful thing is we were talking prior to, your inter, to our starting the interview with social media, it's been able to reconnect some dots back. And you're able to, um, you know, see pictures from back when, you know, um, you know, when they won the championship in 89 or, yep. you know, see different things that were highlights in our life and, you know, 30 years ago. But right. they're still important. And through that, the, the, the relationships are still there. And that's the one thing, you know, um, I credit so, so, social media can be great sometimes and social media cannot be great. This is <laughs> but true. the one thing that it has been able to do, it has been able to connect people together and one, keep people connected and make new relationships just like me and yourself literally just connected a week and a half ago yep. through miles. And, you know, you know, when you reached out to me saying, Hey, could you come in and get on my, my radio show? And I said, without question, because I, I met you through a good friend of mine. And so, you know, and like I said, right now, unfortunately, and in some ways, fortunately, we got time right now. Yeah. So like I said, I appreciate you, you know, asking me to get on. I've had a pretty unique journey. Um, you know, after cause to get into the music business, um, to follow my dream and passion. And, and part of what I do is, you know, I find other young students. I'm on the board of visitors at North Carolina Central University where we went to school. And I go and speak there um, probably two or three times a year to, diff to different students, whether the school of business students, whether some athletes or, um, you know, whether some music students. And so part of you know, the, the upbringing I've gotten through both my parents is you got to pay it forward because if you don't, then to me, that's almost paying, paying rent for your time on earth is making sure you help others be better. Yeah. And that's what I truly believe. And that's so, and that is so, so true. I've, uh, I've inspired from what uh, folks have told me, I've inspired so many broadcasters with, with my journey. And mm -hmm. I listened to Jim Durham call Bulls games for many years and I just had a simple philosophy. If he could do it, I could do it. And I've had so many people ask me, you know, how do you get, how'd you get into the business? How'd you use your degree to get in the business? Well, this is what shocks a lot of people. I don't have a broadcasting degree. I just got 25 years of experience listening to different announcers, Jim Durham being one. Of course, uh, yep. today's announcers, Kevin Harlan, Marv Albert, um, quite a few others, Joe Tate from the uh, yeah, Cleveland no, Cavaliers. I, I I used to listen to Jim Durham because I, I lived in North Carolina. We used to get WGN. Yeah. So I used to listen to I used to listen to him and Big Red and um Yep, Johnny no, Red Kerr. I mean, yep, Johnny Red Kerr and at the end of the day, um Stuart Scott was a yes. good friend of mine. And yeah. so one, he didn't necessarily call games, but the way he made, you know, broadcasting or telling highlights on Sports Center cool. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so Stuart was a good friend. Um, James Brown from CBS, from CBS. Is, a, is a mentor of mine. But, you know, um, Mike Hill that worked on ESPN and now works on Fox as a friend. Yep. So, like I said, fortunately, you know, I've been blessed over the years to, um, you know, meet a lot of these guys and they've ended up becoming good friends. Grant Hill was one of my good, good friends who now is in broadcasting. But he and I were in Durham at the same time when he was at Duke. Right. And I'm a little bit older than him, but. I actually worked in showing how music connects you. I was working at a record store or a CD store in Durham, um, not too far from Duke, kind of in the middle between Duke and North Carolina Central, yeah. that it was in 1989 when CDs were really popular. And Grant Hill, Bobby Hurley, and Thomas Hill, all three guys came into to my CD store, and I helped wait on them. Um, they came in asking about some music, and I waited on them. And from that one interaction – the three of us ended up becoming friends. And to this day, all three of us are still friends. And That's so from great. seeing what Grant was able to do on the court, but then to translate it into the business world where he's a minority, um, he's a minority owner of the Atlanta Hawks, but mm -hmm. in addition, he's, he's a broadcaster. And yeah. so one, um, just, it's just a, been a beautiful thing to just make these good relationships and, and sustain them. And a lot of, a lot of blessings I've had in my life always, End, end up tending to fall back to sports. And that's, you know, I started playing basketball when I was six years old in the YMCA prior to it was even AAU basketball. Right. And to this day, a lot of my same friends that I played basketball with on my first team when I was six years old, we're still friends. 
Beautiful. See, friendships like that are few and far between. And friendships like that you want to keep because you exactly. grew up with those guys. They exactly. know you as exactly. well as as well as you know Not, them. And a, yep. And we stay connected. And the beautiful thing is through social media and through, you know, group texts and, you know, we're able to stay connected. And, um, you know, we, you know, saw our kids grow up. And, you know, unfortunately, when, you know, one of one of our parents, unfortunately, passes away or, Mm -hmm. you know, on or another relative, we're always being being able to be there for each other. And that's at the end of the day what life's about. And, you know, what we're dealing with right now uh, with this coronavirus is something, you know, none of us is have ever seen. Yeah. And so one, you know, all I do is can, you know, I have a wife and a, a eight year old daughter and I'm trying to, to keep my family safe. And my mom who's 88 years old in an independent living community, about 10 minutes from me, we haven't been able to see her for a week and a half because they've had them on quarantine. Yeah. But at the end we moved, we moved my parents down here from, from Greensboro to Charlotte um, just so we could be closer to them. And right. unfortunately, April of 2018, um, my my father passed away, but he was 80. He was 88 years old, and they lived six, been married 64 years. So at the end of the day, he lived a good life. But you know, we wanted to get my mom down here so we could help sustain her quality of life. And you know, she loved basketball, used to go to all of our games, and now she does not miss a Hornets game. So at the end of the day, you know, we're able to give her something to look forward to, and, and that's why even you know, I talked to her prior to me calling in to this interview and. She was doing just what I'm doing, sitting at home watching NBA TV, looking at <laughs> classic NBA games. Because <laughs> really, it's nothing else to really do, right? You know, and right. So, but that's where you know. But my mom was a first grade school teacher for 30 years in Greensboro, and my dad worked in the postal service. So they were both, you know, hardworking and and taught us as a family, um, you know, how to care about each other and how to always give back and. And me and my brother have both been fortunate um, through our careers to be in a position to help others. My brother does a basketball camp uh, called Achievements Unlimited that mm-hmm. this will be the 36th year of the camp. Beautiful. He started it. He started it in 1985 when I was in 10th grade. And the reason he started the camp was because on his first basketball team, five of his 12 teammates were either had either passed away or were in prison or something before he reached 25. Man. And from that, he wanted to make a difference and start a camp. And we did a camp. We did the camp 25 years in Greensboro. And we've now gone into our 12th year here in Charlotte. It's called Achievements Unlimited. And, and we've seen over 10,000 kids over the course of those years come through his camp. And he's had a lot of good achievements, um, being the president of the Hornets and a bunch of other stuff. But his greatest achievement was this camp that he literally started in 1985 to give back to, to young kids. And at the end of the day, that's truly what it's all about is giving back to others. That is truly, truly it. Giving back to others. And I've had a pleasure having this man on Charles Whitfield joining me here 25 years in the sports and business and in, in the uh, music industry. I'm celebrating this August, my 25th year in broadcasting. I really feel it was destined. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I really feel it was destined for us to connect this is Charles Whitfield. Absolutely. Tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. You can find me on social media on Instagram at uh, Charles W10 um, on on Twitter Charles two three two three and on Facebook at Charles Whitfield. Uh, so once again, Instagram at Charles W10, uh, Facebook Charles Whitfield, and on Twitter at Charles two three two three. And of course. Anybody who knows basketball knows who originated the number 23. Thanks a lot, my friend. I really, <laughs> really so appreciate much. it. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, anytime you need me, just reach out, and I'd, I'd be glad to jump on again. I really appreciate it. Got some more for you folks after the break.
You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Sports and culture combined into one. You know, folks, we have been living in, to say the least, weird times. No sports going on, at least not live. The fellow I have on the other side of the hotline right now does the same thing I do. He has a microphone in front of him, but nothing to broadcast, at least not yet. Dave Barnett now joins me. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Brian. How are you? I'm I'm hold, I'm hanging in there. How are you coping during this um how are you coping during this pandemic, my friend? Well, um the only thing I could compare it to is uh 9/11. Yeah. And the difference is after the initial shock of 9/11, I would say within two weeks, the sports world had adjusted and had figured out a way to move on. And obviously that is not the important thing uh, in the big picture, but that's, you know, for what we're dealing with now, that's the only comparison I think that I can make. And um, you knew that that wasn't going to be indefinite like this, as horrible as it was. Mm -hmm. And really it, it only cost, the sports world, not even two weeks, I think, um, no. because I was actually, I was doing the only sporting event in the country that didn't shut down really? after nine 11, um, for ESPN. It was the U S senior women's amateur golf championship ah. in Pennsylvania. And they decided to carry on because all the golfers were there and they'd already played their practice rounds. And, um, I think it started on the 13th. Uh, and they played on, and then a lot of our crew were supposed to go from Pennsylvania to Baton Rouge to do Auburn at LSU. And um, it still amazes me that uh, the ESPN logistics people, uh, once that was canceled, and the SEC was the last league to cancel things that, that weekend, uh, but they found a way to get everybody home. Uh, but then the following week, you know, schedules had picked back up. And games were made up in the uh, first weekend in, in December. This looks like it could stretch all the way through summer. And I know college football is um, optimistically hoping to get a season in, which may mean there's no gap between the end of the regular season and the conference championship games and the bowl season. You know, it may be nonstop football yeah. and that's even being optimistic i mean there are people that say it probably isn't going to come off at all so the the aspect of figuring this out on the fly and it, it literally changes by the day and some days it changes by the hour that's the thing that um is is the most unsettling because there there is no dress rehearsal there's no real comparison to make and you know, in a, in a few months, hopefully, we'll um, have seen how the various sports and the leagues have figured out how to go on. Um, the good news there would be that apparently they've gotten the pandemic under control. Yeah. Do you think there will be a football season, college or pro? What are your thoughts? Um, it's impossible to predict. I think it would it would be more surprising to me at this point if football carried off with no delay. I think that would, that would be almost miraculous at this point. That would mean training camps in August and first weekend of college football is, uh, you know, the, the end of August. Mm-hmm. Um, every day that goes by, that seems less and less likely. And I see more and more schools and leagues planning on that not being the case. But if they could play all but September, you know, maybe – teams lose most of their non-conference games, but most of the conference schedules could still take place. Um, it'd be really hard to, to rank teams, you know, based on um, not playing the same number of games, not playing some of the tough non-conference opponents that they had planned to. I mean, it, it would it would definitely be a, a huge asterisk by everything that happened in that season, but at least there would be a season. Yeah. You know, so I, I think even if, if they pick it up in November, I think if it's at all possible, even if teams could only play eight games, if that meant they go all the way through November, December, and straight into conference championships, bowls, 
whatnot. I mean, if, if that's even logistically possible with the stadiums they use, I, I think the powers that be will do whatever they can to salvage whatever there is to salvage. Do you think that would hold true for the NBA and uh, Major League Baseball? Um, I think they'll be as creative as they need to be. I mean, the NBA already talking about playing an entire postseason in one arena with no fans. Yeah. You know, that that's uh, that's about as creative, I think, as, as you could get. Um, um, so I think baseball, you know, baseball's dealt with strikes. If there's any sport that's probably – best positioned to uh, ad lib, it would be baseball because they've played partial seasons before. Uh, most recently, 1994. So right. if baseball picks up, you know, even if baseball picks up in September, well, okay, then it's going to be a, a sprint to the finish. One month of baseball and see where we are and then postseason starts. Yeah, that would be true and that's probably the scenario we're looking at. Dave Barnett joining me, uh man, uh voice of Fox Sports, one of the voices of Fox Sports and Westwood One and voice of the North Texas Mean Green talking coronavirus pandemic and how it affects sports right now. Whom do you think which group, college athletes or pro athletes are you, do you think is the most affected at this moment? Well, I think college athletes and especially seniors, um, as you said, I broadcast from my alma mater, University of North Texas, and this was a dream season. They won the regular season conference USA championship, Mm -hmm. top seed going into the conference tournament, which was canceled the day they were supposed to play their first game, the quarterfinals. So if there'd been an NCAA tournament, they would have gotten the automatic bid. And later that same day, there was no NCAA tournament. So, there were three seniors on that team. There are, there are teams all over the country that, you know, have, have seniors that didn't think they were playing their final game. And it turned out they already had. So that's tough to replace. Um, the spring sport athletes will get another season. There will be baseball teams next year that have double rosters um, yeah. because they'll have the players that would be seniors next year and the ones that would be seniors this year. So there's an adjustment there, but the winter sports and, and in particular basketball, those are the kids that I really feel for. Yeah, those those are the kids I feel for also, you know, not having a chance to replay their their senior season. The NCAA did it Matter right. Fact, and one in particular, here is the one kid that the first kid I thought about. Okay. Um, is a point guard for Gonzaga, Ryan Woolridge, who transferred as a graduate from North Texas. And the reason he transferred was he didn't want his career to go by without playing in the NCAA tournament. Well, as it turns out, he would have had a great chance to play in the NCAA tournament if he stayed put, but he knew he would make it at Gonzaga. And there he is on, you know, arguably um, favorite to win the national championship. Right. And he moved halfway across the country for that to happen. And now he's deprived of the opportunity to play so there are stories like that but he's he's the one that i think is really got to be um feeling it more than anybody that i know yeah the day that everything shut down you know i was here in studio all the alerts were coming in uh wife and i had gone to work we come back and you know she put the bug in my ear about you know conference tournaments shutting down and the alerts that were flying on my phone and across the screen and then all of a sudden it just seemed like at that moment everything shut down the ncaa was the ncaa tournament was the last thing to be canceled you know i don't think there's any logistical way they could have postponed this and played it in in the spring your thoughts on that Probably not. Uh, that would have been difficult because of the arena availability and uh, lots of different factors. Um, so, you know, I, I think it would have been a nice gesture if the NCAA had at least gone ahead and done bids. So at least, you know, that would have been a nice gift for the fans, mm-hmm. you know, fans of schools that had never gotten a bid or it had been a long time could say, well, okay, we were going to be a 13 seed and that's how they can, you know, at least look back on this season. Obviously it wouldn't have been 
the same, but it would have been a nice gesture. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, it, again, in the big picture, this isn't literally life or death, but in the arena you and I work with, um, you know, there are human stories and, uh, I'll trace it to the Rudy Gobert story because the conference tournaments were going on. Yep. And, and Rudy Gobert did his thing at the press conference and grabbed all the microphones. Mm-hmm. And then it turns out he's positive. And then it turns out his teammate, Donovan Mitchell, was positive. And that's the moment that sports shut down. Yeah. I mean, it might have happened any day. It, it, it may have happened anyway, but that was the catalyst. That's, yeah. that's how I will look back on this. That's how I look back on it also. Dave Barnett, the man is who is the voice of the Mean Green of the University of North Texas. You can also hear him at Westwood One and also with Fox Sports. I am happy to have you on, my friend. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, and I hope you come back again soon. Well, hopefully under better circumstances we can visit again, Brian. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Anytime, Brian. Thank you. Stick around. I got more for you after this. tuned in to the daily bs sports and culture combined into one hour two all right folks i haven't had this man on in a while and we hope everyone is staying safe with this coronavirus pandemic that's that's going on please take care of yourselves but let a friend of mine and i distract you from this pandemic with a little bit of football mike debate joins me from full press coverage as well as the host of Locked On Patriots. He's on the other side of the hotline right now. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, my friend. Hope you and yours are staying as safe and as uh, as well as possible. Uh, again, uh, interesting times in which we live, but uh, thankfully we're able to share the microphone today and hopefully give our listeners a little distraction from everything that's been going on. Absolutely. You hear Mike every every week during the football season and now into the off season, which may be extended a little bit. You're going to hear him a lot more. We prepare for the draft and for the 2020 season. There was rumor. There were rumors floating around that Tom Brady may come home to San Francisco, but the 49ers chose to stay with Jimmy with Jimmy Garoppolo. And in two words, right move. 
Absolutely. Right move. Um, if you're the San Francisco 49ers and you have the opportunity to bring in a quarterback like Tom Brady, it's so difficult to pass that up unless you have the nucleus in place that the 49ers have. And that includes Jimmy Garoppolo. Look, I know a lot of people wanted to make some big deal out of the way he played in the second half of the Super Bowl and maybe indicate that that meant that maybe Jimmy wasn't ready for prime time. I sincerely disagree with that, uh, and I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Jimmy, I think, played admirably in the Super Bowl. I think he played admirably all season last year. A lot of people forget, and we've talked about this several times here on this show, my friend, he came off of a very debilitating injury. It took him a while to get back into the swing of things. Look at what he did in his first year back. I think that's pretty <laughs> impressive, <laughs> folks. And, you know, I mean, he takes this team within an eyelash of winning a uh, Super Bowl. Uh, I think to give up on that was disingenuous. And I think you saw Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch, and the San Francisco 49ers brain trust realize what they had in Jimmy. And I think they realized that this was their opportunity to really move forward. Uh, you have a guy that's under contract for the next five years. He's young. He's very capable of leading this team for a good number of years. And I think you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of the ceiling that Jimmy can reach, where you know I, there is no one I hold in higher regard that's ever worn shoulder pads than Thomas Edward Patrick Brady Jr. I remain a fan of his now. I will until the day I die. But when you take a look at the fact that he's going to be 43, you don't jettison a young quarterback at the age of 28 that was capable of bringing you to a Super Bowl for one or two years at maximum. So while it would have been a great story, I think Tom would have loved to go to San Francisco and finish his career there. But ultimately, they had the right guy in place and they made the right decision by sticking with Jimmy G. And look at the weapons around him. Raheem Mostert, Tevin Coleman, Matt Breida. And, folks, Breida is staying put. Until I see something different, Breida is staying put. So you got a three-headed monster in the backfield. Coleman and Mostert shouldered most of the load the second half of the season, yes. But you you got to include Breida. Uh, Kyle Juszczyk, their outstanding fullback. Kind of reminds you of Tom Rathman, doesn't he? The best tight end of the game in George Kittle. You got Debo Samuel on, on one side. Kendrick Bourne. Yes, you lost Emmanuel Sanders in free agency, but don't forget, Niners fans, there's a fellow by the name of Jalen Hurd who you and I tracked out of Baylor who was selected by the 49ers, couldn't play this past season due to a debilitating back injury, but I expect him to be on the opposite side of Debo Samuel. And if it's if it's possible for this offense to get even more dangerous, here comes Jalen Hurd. Absolutely. And Hurd out of Baylor is somebody that I had mocked several times hoping that the New England Patriots would be able to pick him up. <laughs> of course, I mocked Debo Samuel quite a few times to the Patriots, too. So the Niners definitely had their eye on guys that I had my eye on. But uh, I like to think their brain trust is a little smarter than mine. But uh, you know what? In any case, uh, I agree with you on Hurd. I think this guy has a tremendous opportunity now to fit in to an offensive system that I believe is tailor-made for him. And he's tailor-made for it. The loss of Emmanuel Sanders is going to be a tough one, but let's not forget that Sanders is not a guy that came into training camp with the 49ers last year. He fit in very well. He was admirable in everything that he did. However, the 49ers were the 49ers before Emmanuel Sanders got there. Emmanuel yeah, Sanders added another dimension to that, but he did not define who they were. They weren't an also-ran team that all of a sudden ascended to the next level. They were already at the top of the conference. So, this was an addition move. He was a great player for them, and I'm definitely in no way disparaging Emmanuel Sanders, but it's capable, or it's possible, I should say, for Hurd or somebody else to be capable of filling those shoes. And you mentioned Matt Breda. You mentioned Coleman. You mentioned Moster. They rode that three-headed monster of a running attack all the way to a Super Bowl near a Super Bowl title. So there's no reason to believe they can't do the same thing again. You and I are both big fans of Breda. You've been uh, an advocate of his. You've made me study him a lot more, and I appreciate that because I really believe that this kid has uh, a great amount of uh, talent and a lot of uh, ability to be able to get the job done. So I like this uh, um, this offense of the San Francisco 49ers, and again, I think Jimmy is the perfect guy to be leading it. And speaking of... Um, Garoppolo leading this offense. 
who expected, besides yours truly, who expected the 49ers to not only contend in the NFC, but win the West and have home field advantage throughout the NFC playoffs? And Al Michael said it best on the last regular season game, a nice path to Miami. Not very many people gave the 49ers a chance to not just compete in the NFC West, but win the division, get a week off to heal, and then, for lack of a better term, two blowouts in Santa Clara. Absolutely. And again, I give you all the credit in the world, and much more so than myself. And even in the off season, right around this time last year, when, uh, oh man, when I was celebrating a Super Bowl championship with the Patriots. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I, <laughs> you got, you got, we have to live a little bit in the past right now. I'm living vicariously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually went through. I actually went through the parade photos on my phone today, which was probably not a good idea, Brian. But you know what? You needed something to uplift the spirits. But yeah. uh, no, in all actuality, last year, right around this time, we were talking about the. Um, the prognostication, I guess is the best way for me to put it, like that big word, um, for the 49ers and what it meant for their season going forward. You were extremely high on the 49ers. And I'll be honest, I thought they would be in contention. I did not believe they would be at the level that they ended up being. But you believed in them right from the get-go. And it made me want to learn more about the team and study the team. And the more I studied, the more I liked it. This is, I think, a very good interesting off season for them they have the target on their back a little bit more now they're not going to sneak up on a lot of people so that's one thing if i'm a niners fan i want to keep a sharp eye on how they handle being the target being the hunted one uh i know that from personal experience up here in new england for the last 20 years Mm -hmm. you have teams coming into new england coming into foxborough treating it like their super bowl uh the niners will experience that this year people are going to be coming in especially in the nfc and they're going to want to be on their game. They're going to want to be taking everything that they can to the 49ers. And I know the organization as a whole, as their history is used to that, but this group of 49ers, this is the new opportunity for them to prove that they are the class in the NFC. I think they have the discipline and the makeup to do just that. And I expect to turn heads this year again, just as they did last year. Well, they turned heads during this off season by sending DeForest Buckner, their team MVP to Indianapolis and they get the 13th overall selection in this year's draft. And I've had people ask me, you know, which way are they going to lean? Are they going to lean offense? Are they going to lean defense? They're going to lean right back to South Carolina. This is my, this is part of my mock draft. They're going to go right back to South Carolina, and there's a defensive end by the name of Javon Kinlaw that I believe is going to be staring them right in the face. Absolutely. And honestly, that is who I have mocked for the 49ers in several versions of mock drafts that I've done for the draftnetwork.com or for the Locked On Podcast Network. We do a lot of prognosticating on our shows. And Ken Law is the guy that I think is a hand and glove fit for the 49ers. Look, he's quick off the block. He's able to box out. He has that discipline and he has the pedigree to be able to make an immediate impact on a defense. When you're looking at a defense that's been as prolific as the 49ers was this year, adding a guy like Kinlaw is really, I don't want to say it's a wash because I think that does Buckner a disservice. He's a tremendous player. I think the 49ers in a perfect world would have loved to have held on to him, but I think they saw an opportunity to be able to get similar production, better value, and save money in the process. By doing that, I think they were smart in making this move. And again, I think Buckner is going to do a tremendous job in Indianapolis, but I also believe that the 49ers have positioned themselves well to be able to get his replacement. And I'd be surprised if they went with anyone other than Ken Law, unless he's not on the board. Unless uh, unless Ken Law's not on the board, I see Ken Law falling right into San Francisco's lap the same way you and I were correct in predicting Nick Bosa would fall to the 49ers. Now, a lot of people got on the bandwagon late, Last year before the draft, seeing Nick Bosa to San Francisco, and then, you know, we heard the rumbles. You and I both heard them. We spoke about it on my show, talking about, oh, it's going to be a couple of years before Bosa really makes an impact. Eh, Wrong answer. He made an impact immediately. Three sacks in the game against Carolina, plus an interception. He was the overall rookie of the year and the runaway rookie of the year. And Javon Kinlaw fits that 49er defense with Robert Sala as their coach, hand and glove and he could repeat the exact same year that nick bosa had so you will allow bosa to gain a year you will allow solomon thomas out of stanford to gain a year eric armstead who had a five-year extension given to him and richly richly earned 
So you go across that front line and you're not going to lose any production, even if you do stick another rookie like Javon Kinlaw, six foot five, 324 pounds. You think he won't pressure the quarterback in that system? You won't think he'll have fun in that system? Man, Robert Sala, all he has to do, and we started talking about this last year after the performance in Los Angeles against the Rams, all Sala has to do is turn the dogs loose. And the difference between this 49er defense and other defenses around the league that try to – get to the quarterback with only four pass rushers the 49ers get home and they get home fast they do and their versatility in that lineup really allows them to play a traditional 4-3 it allows them to go back and to switch it up a little bit and play some 3-4 as well very few teams in the league have the ability to do that including the patriots whom i cover who really played primarily a 3-4 last year because of the versatility of their linebackers I think they have to make a return to the 4-3 this year because they don't have that. They've lost Kyle Van Noy. They've lost James Collins. They've lost the Landon Roberts. It's going to be difficult for them to replicate that. So I look for them to play more 4-3. The 49ers, on the other hand, have a tremendous opportunity to be able to play both and play them equally well. That's what makes them such a formidable defense. And in my opinion, that's what separates them from the rest of the pack when it comes to contenders in the NFC. And if you want to be the NFC champions, you're going to have to go through Santa Clara. You're going to have to go through the 49ers and, you know, on the road to Tampa, the the only place the 49ers have not conquered in their Super Bowl travels. I don't see anyone stopping them. I just don't. No, I don't either. And that includes my good friend Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which <laughs> right. I know a lot of people want to not want to make them the flavor of the month. And look, I think Tom Brady makes the Tampa Bay Buccaneers markedly better. And yes. I think they will be a contender. Uh, they'll be in the playoffs this year, folks. Tom's not going down there to lose. I can guarantee you that. Oh, and no. they have the talent to be able to contend. However, when you look at both sides of the ball, I think Tampa still has some questions defensively. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, well, it was because Jameis Winston threw 30 interceptions and they never had a chance to really set themselves and they were constantly defending against the turnover. Some of that is true, but until you've been able to prove it on the big stage, it really hasn't happened yet as far as I'm concerned. So there are still question marks when it comes to Tampa Bay's defense. I still think the running game might be a question mark for them. Uh, I think that uh, you know Tom definitely has his, his weapon of choice when it comes to the wide receiver position. Mm-hmm. Even the tight end position, I think he's got a pretty good amount of uh, weapons there as well. I'd like to see them from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Really uh, solidify their running game, I think, is the best way for uh, for me to put it uh, before I start anointing them. But then you look at teams like the New Orleans Saints, who really have made a tremendous amount of uh, progress, bringing in Emmanuel Sanders, who we talked about earlier, yeah. uh, shoring up that defense a little bit. That is a strong team. Seattle Seahawks have made themselves better, uh, even just by bringing in a guy like uh, Philip Dorsett, who I know doesn't turn a lot of heads, but I've covered Philip for three years here in New England. I can mm-hmm. tell you that in the right system, he's got blazing speed and he still has the ability to be an effective receiver. And then, of course, the Green Bay Packers. You can't count out a team that is quarterbacked by Aaron Rodgers. Absolutely he's automatically not. going to make that team a contender. The Minnesota Vikings turned a lot of heads this year. Yes, they lost the Fon Diggs, but they have you know, made a, a opportunities for them to replicate some of what he did. And Kirk Cousins, for all his you know, for all his faults that he takes in the media, he's still been able to uh, uh, to bring that team to prominence. So this is going to be an interesting year. And of course, we haven't even touched on the monsters of the midway in the Chicago, Chicago Bears. Dub Bears, <laughs> Dub Bears, with Nick Foles playing the quarterback. Yep. And you know, and there's a possibility that he could make that team that much more formidable. You take a look now, all of a sudden, at Khalil Mack and Robert Quinn. That is a fearsome defense so the nfc is going to be fun to watch this year (laughs) it is the nfc is going to be fun to watch the nfc south in particular is going to be fun to watch the only two teams that didn't make any quarterback moves were the new orleans saints and the atlanta falcons breeze comes back for another year matt ryan is still in atlanta Tom Brady comes to the NFC South which is probably going to be the most competitive division outside of the NFC West but you know, as much love as I have for Tom Brady, you got to go through Cool Breeze to claim that division. And that's a process in and of itself. It is. And don't forget, Breeze has a lot of experience playing in that division. Tom does not. And, you know, I mean, it's 
it's one thing to be able to adapt to situations. If there's any quarterback that can adapt to a situation quickly and not be fooled by anything an opposing defense is going to throw at him, it's Tom Brady. He's seen it all. He's done it all. However, Breeze has been the king of that division for quite a while now. And yep. I think there's still something to be said about the New Orleans Saints and the stranglehold that they've had, uh, you know, playing in that division. And albeit, I mean, there have been, you know, moments where Atlanta has had their moments. And, you know, a few years ago, they made the run all the way to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Patriots fans remember that extremely well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you look at the Carolina Panthers and what they've been able to do. And bringing in a guy like Teddy Bridgewater, I think, is brilliant. I think he's a perfect fit Absolutely. for that team. So. That is going to be a very interesting division. Uh, it's going to be a tough division. It's going to be a fun division to watch. There's going to be a lot of points put up in that division this year. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And plus, we get to see Tom Brady versus Drew Brees twice, once in Tampa, once in New Orleans. But, again, my statement remains, and I know yours echoes with me. Until uh, If you want to be the champs, you got to beat the champs. Right now, the NFC champs are in Santa Clara, California. And I just – I'll say it again, and I know this is early – but at the same time, given the way that I've watched the NFC and I've covered the NFC, you know, for the past some 12, 12, 13 years and the last six on this show, the way this 49ers team is managed and run and put together and plus not one but two first round picks, I don't see anybody knocking them off for a while. I don't either. And the way that they're constituted – the way that they've been able to build on offense and on defense, I still see them as the class of the NFC. And again, you put it very eloquently. Until someone proves that they can beat them, they're the champs. You have to go through them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're unbeatable, but what it means is that they are the least likely to be beat. And I think that that's something that is is probably something people need to remember. Don't necessarily go with the flavor of the month here, folks. Use your eyes. Use your common sense. Take a look at the rosters from start to finish. I still think San Francisco is a cut above the rest. And it's going to be fun to see, watching them defend their division title and their conference title. And much too early as it may seem to a lot of people, I believe there's going to be a sixth celebration of a Super Bowl next February in San Francisco. Stay tuned, folks. That's Mike DeBate. He joins me each and every week to talk NFL. We're going to lead you up to and through the draft. Going to give you our mock drafts, and we got a lot in store for you. This man is in charge of Locked On Patriots as well as part of the full press co- part of full press coverage uh, network that syndicates our show. Man, they're a fabulous network. Please check them out at fullpresscoverage.com and hit my man up at Locked On Patriots. Such a thrill and a pleasure to have you on. I love you, and thanks for coming on, my friend. Absolutely. The feeling is definitely mutual, Brian. Please, you and yours, stay safe. Stay safe, everyone out there, and uh, hopefully sports can give you some sort of a diversion. But it's always a pleasure to share the microphone with you, my friend. We really appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.
tuned in to the Daily BS. Sports and culture combined into one. Okay, folks. Normally, I would lead off the show with, you know, a little subject, a little sports subject or a life subject or a funny husband story. But this time, I decided to get someone, a very dear friend of mine, to ride shotgun. And this dear friend of mine asks a very important question, which is... Did you miss me? (laughs) The one and only Mr. Controversy, (laughs) Raphael Haynes, joins the show to to kick off this day. How are you, man? I'm good, snowman, trying to um, keep myself busy with no sports, but I'm good. You doing all right? <laughs> how, are you, how are you keeping yourself busy besides your family? Man. Because the last time I talked to you, your littlest one had just been born, and you, you became a father again. So how are you keeping busy without sports? Well, besides the family, um been uh, daydreaming about if Michael Jordan and Bill Russell could play against <laughs> Vince Carter and Will Chamberlain. Uh, <laughs> man, I've been trying. <laughs> I've been trying to keep busy. Was, uh, can, can we just a mess right now? <laughs> there we go. There's there's our subject: dream matchups, dream dream NBA matchups, because you and I have seen quite a few of them, and you just mentioned like a one of the ultimate two on two matchups. Michael Jordan right. and Bill Russell versus Vince Carter and Wilt Chamberlain. But actually I'd make a switch. I mean I love Vince Carter, but I'd actually put Julia Serving and, and Wilt Chamberlain on another side. Oh yeah, I agree. I agree. You know I was kidding, but I think that's a good matchup right there. Yes. Sir. There you go. There yeah. you go. But man, it's it's crazy because um it is. Like you said, go, going with what's going on right now, you know, we, we would have never thought. Well, I'll say this. I've always said this. When every time when America goes through tragedy, no matter what it is, 9-11, the Boston, um, remember the massacre uh, with the race, uh, yep. marathon massacre, uh, what, whatever it is, we've always had sports to rely on Mm -hmm. and sports was always that band-aid always that outlet to where it took us away from the you know whatever was going on in the world even with stuff that goes on personally if i got something going on with my family or work anything personal is just horrible i'm going through it right i was able to take my mind off of it for three hours to watch this football game (laughs) or two and a half to watch basketball or baseball Yes. But now when we going through this pandemic, the one thing that we always knew we could turn to is no longer there. Right. So it's really hard for us to even cope with. And then the fact that, I mean, let's be honest, those of us are, that are married or have significant others, or even just by themselves, like, what? <laughs> we don't have nothing. <laughs> we don't have no outlet no more. <laughs> it's, we, like we now, <laughs> it's like now what? <laughs> right. Right. What? You know, I don't know what this life is like. I've never been here before. Like, this is. I had, you know, I had a classmate some 30 years ago tell me if I ever stopped liking sports that I could give her a call. I haven't called her in 30 years, nor do I plan to. <laughs> man, and, you know, so it's something it's time, else. Man. It's something yeah, else, it's, isn't it? And I like, I like the fact that right now, one thing I, I have noticed is funny because usually, and you know, we all live in the social media world, and mm-hmm. you know, we we're me and you, you know, you and I, we have um, friends that both of us know. You know, we're yes. we're acquainted with a lot of people that we each know, right. And sometimes in the social world, some people, you know, you have the, I don't want to sound corny, but I, just people be, some people could get jealous or mm-hmm. some people don't like this. or Not even jealous. Some people don't just like, be, like the fact that I like LeBron and somebody else like, you know, <laughs> but during this time, if you notice Snowman, everyone has gotten along together. Everyone, yeah. it, it almost kind of, it's kind of nostalgic because it, it brings back 
those days when social media, Facebook and all that first started. And remember, we would just always debate, you know, always yeah. ask questions, who's better or who do you like? Exactly. And, and everybody joined in and it was a good time. And, and it seemed like after a while when everybody kind of branched off and wanted to, you know, create their own businesses or do their own thing, you know, we kind of got away from that. But yeah. It, but now that we don't have sports, that's what we're relying on. And honestly, it's kind of fun. It is. I miss, you know, I'm kind of liking it. It is. It It is fun because I did a, a segment on my show of why Roger Craig and John Taylor should be in the Hall of Fame. You know, those two are 49er fame from the from the 80s. Boy, I had some fun with some people that chimed in on that. And they're still chiming in on wow. that. So it's like it, yeah. it's like you said that band-aid it's not there but in, at the same time it's creating another band-aid we can actually right. debate now okay right. debate we can and have actually, fun and people not getting their feelings now right because we know what's going on so we're we, having fun we're debating but it's still all in fun you it's, know it's lunchroom so, yeah, it's lunchroom it. talk all over again it's high school lunchroom right, right. talk all over again let's 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 go to the nba and let's do some let's do some matchups Okay, one of which we've seen already, and you know this one. And we're gonna do this in pairs, folks. And if you got a favorite pair, tweet the show at SNW Digital Media or follow this man, Mr. Controversy, the man in charge of the three point conversion, and let him know your favorite pair also. We saw this matchup in nineteen ninety six. Jordan and Pippen versus Peyton and Kemp. Mm-hmm. We saw that one. So yeah, we saw that one, uh huh. And you're asking for my opinion? Yeah. I mean, we already saw the oh, result. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's not even close, right? Yeah, we saw uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. So hey, let's... Although I say, I was just, it's funny you bring that up because I was just talking about this the other day. Even though, of course, Fibber and Jordan destroyed them. But yeah. yeah, they did. I will give credit to Sean Kemp. That finals, Sean Kemp had a great final. I think he averaged he... close to like, uh, don't quote me. 26, 27, but he had great games. He did during that final. Like he stepped up and showed me something. Like wow, okay, this dude is he's really nice. He's playing yeah. when it counts. Yeah. So yeah, but no, nah, that's, that's not even. Close. I mean, okay, here's a dream. Here's a dream matchup for you, in terms of two, just in terms of two on twos, and mm-hmm. I know I'm really digging for this one, but Mark Jackson and Reggie Miller. Versus Peyton and Kemp, outside tandem versus an inside tandem. Man, you know what? <laughs> here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. That's a very interesting matchup because with Mark Jackson, Mark Jackson is probably one of the most underrated players of all time. I'll agree with um, that in basketball and. But do you do you put Peyton on Reggie, <laughs> or do you put him on Kemp? Because right. here's the thing: Mark Jackson. The reason why he's underrated because Mark Jackson. One thing he's, I mean, great NBA IQ. Yes, but a basketball IQ, I should say. Yeah. But he can all. He had a little floater, mm-hmm. little teardrop. He mm-hmm. was one of the, I think he was one of the ones that kind of created that a teardrop. Yeah, and then. His post up game was very underrated. Yeah, he, he very much so. He you up and back you down. He didn't use it just to score, but he used it to set up the pass. So he if did. you got him and Gary Payton, the only thing is, well, who would you put Gary Payton on? Because Reggie, as good as Reggie Miller was, most of Reggie Miller's game came off a screen, yep. running around. So, you know, then you look at if they're. If there is just two on two, I don't think they would be able to stop Seattle because we know Gary Payton can post you up as well. Gary true. Payton can get by you, and then who's going to go at Sean Kemp? True, very true. The, man, the one of the original men childs, one of the original right, man childs. Right. Okay, I got exactly. I, I got one for you. Here's a fantasy matchup for you, and I'm going across eras here. KJ and Dan Marley versus. Mike Bibby and Chris Webber. So you got a little bit of the old school with the Phoenix Suns, and then you got that 2001-2002 Sacramento team. Um, 
Mm. You know what? Because we know that we know that um, Dan Marley can't guard um, not Sean Kemp, but uh, Chris <laughs> Webber. You know he can't guard C. Well, right? But Bibby couldn't guard KJ. Like it was a lot this of people true. who couldn't guard KJ. Who, who could guard, guard KJ? This is why he's one of my favorite point guards of all time because he was that unguardable. He was that right. he was that unguardable, and he was also that fast. But here's a point guard matchup right. for you. We know he he uh, KJ blossomed when he got to Phoenix. How about the fellow who stayed in his place in Cleveland, Mark Price? Mm. And Mark Price and who else? Uh, let's go KJ and Barkley versus Price and Doherty. All right, see, and I keep bringing un- underrated players, another underrated player, Mark Price. But, yes. well, KJ and Mark Price, but Mark yes, Price, he, did. He, w- he was one of the guys that Mark Price could shoot, but Mark Price could get to the hole. He, mm-hmm. he had, Mark Price had, he was the best ice call when he, when they would, when they would do a, um, he, they would set the screen, set the yep. screen for Mark Price. Yep. The way he would use that screen, go between his legs. I don't. Mark Price is <laughs> like he's so underrated. Yeah. But then Darty was too. Brad Darty was too. But I just don't think he can stick Barkley. Barkley was too much for him. Yeah. I think KJ was too yeah. much for Mark Price. KJ didn't play defense like that either. So it almost might be a, a wash in the sense. True. But Barkley would be the um, big factor. The only thing I hated about Darty's career it was cut short due to a back injury I loved watching right. Darty play Darty was that centerpiece you know who, for them you know who Darty remind me of he, and I know I'm going to get a stop he, I'm, he wasn't as good but Darty was kind of like and hear, hear me out was like the first Tim Duncan what I mean by that is no, I it actually no agree with that. No flash to daughter game. No. No flash to his game. None. But he was very fundamentally sound. Yeah. That's very fundamentally sound. And, and I get I give you no argument with that. Darty was indeed the first version of, of Tim Duncan. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say stop it. I loved watching both of them play. There's your there's a fantasy matchup right there. Brad Darty right. versus and, and Tim and Duncan. Yeah, and it wasn't that he was as good as Tim Duncan. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying his style, no flash. Right. Everything was fundament fundamentals. Um, good footwork. And he just did Excellent his job. Footwork. Grab rebound play, and he was just that. You know, and like you said, his, his career was cut short. And I don't think, he, like I said, I don't think he would have been as good as Tim Duncan. But he was, he was good. He was a good center. I mean, he made made an All Star. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if he made two or not, but I know he he was one of the top. Um, I guess respected centers back then. Indeed, because uh, again, with his career cut short due to a back injury, he was leading the way into what would be the Tim Duncan era. And I give you no argument because, like Tim Duncan, Brad Darty was very fundamentally sound. Fundamentals are, and I, I get so much flack when I say this statement. Fundamentals are missing in the NBA today. I miss having mm-hmm. people that are fundamentally sound play the game. And then when you bring up folks like Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and others that do play with fundamentals, you get pushback right. for it. Lord yep. knows I've gotten pushback for it for saying it every, sing- every single time. But if you think about it, when you have fundamentals, you have a better game. Mm-hmm. You absolutely yeah, that, have a better that's what game. Made, and that's what made, I think, and I know that people will say, okay, this is to get off my lawn segment. No, it's not. <laughs> but just where I came from, you know, watching the games when, like we watched it back then, you're, the greats, and it's kind of like that now in a sense, some of them, but back then your best players were fundamentally sound, all of them. Mm-hmm. Barkley, Jordan, they can be the greatest, they got flash, but – they're always good at fundamentals. Absolutely. You know, they all had it. Absolutely. Footwork, 
the you know it, the preparation, the um, it, 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 all of them had it. It was and all there. Look at today. Some of them, like you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Steph Curry. He, he he's like that. I I don't think LeBron is fundamentally sound. I think he's more athletic. Mm-hmm. You know, he has that athletic ability, and, and that's but, been um, my that's been my biggest argument against LeBron. You know, people don't hear me out. Listen carefully, folks. I've always said that LeBron is a very gifted athlete. He's a very gifted athlete. Problem is, he's not a fundamentally sound basketball player. That's all I've been saying. You know, and people want to throw numbers at me and throw the stats at me. You can throw them at me all you want. My argument remains. He's a great athlete but doesn't have a complete set of basketball skills, fundamental basketball skills. That's always been my argument. Right, yeah, and and like you said, because he's so athletic and he's gifted, he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have to use all that. Now, I, I will give him this. The last three or four years, three years, four, maybe four, He's worked on his fundamentals. That he has. You, you, you see in, in his game, you know, because as athletic as he is now, even still, at the year 17, <laughs> he lost a little bit of that, you know, yeah. athleticism. Absolutely. But still, and, and I think that's why now you see him with the 11 assists. Like his IQ, is, he, he has a great IQ. And, you mm-hmm. know, I, I still don't think it's the greatest of ever. I don't agree with that. But right. his right. IQ is up there. It's high. Basketball IQ is up there. It is. It really is. And he knows basketball, you know, but, and that's why he's able, I think, now to get a, a lead a league and assist at year 17 and still, mm-hmm. still score, still be able to score 25 points a game. And because, you know, he doesn't depend on the athleticism like he used to, just that. He's gotten better. I still don't he think has. he's one of the top fundamental fundamentally players, you know what I'm saying, that, that that can, that he knows or he's great at, no, I don't think he's great at his, or his fundamentals are great, you know, yeah. using like, no, I don't think so. But he's gotten better. I'm not saying he doesn't have any at all. It right. used to be right. where it, he could play, it was just all athleticism, which, that's how he could, that's how good he was. But I said that when he first came to the league, he was like, okay, like LeBron is, LeBron is a bad boy, but yeah, athlete. That's, and that's it. I like to say, that's now, the, I think now he's gotten better. He has. But I said, it is later athlete. years. Yeah, and, I, and I've said this. I've said this on my program, and I've said it on social media. And you've you've seen me say it on social media. I've never said that he's not a gifted athlete. He's a wonderfully gifted athlete. He's just incomplete as a. He's gotten better in his later years. Do not get it twisted. He's gotten better right. in his later years. But he was just so much a raw talent and not a complete basketball player. That's been my argument. And people have always, and you've seen the responses I get on social media, people's always, people always mistake that for hate instead of asking questions. I'm like, why are you hating against LeBron? I'm not hating against LeBron. Hear me out, please. It's, he, he's gotten fundamentally better especially in year 17. Do not get it twisted. He's gotten better, but he didn't come into the NBA with that fundamental package. No, he didn't. I mean, and like you say, like we say, he didn't have to, I guess, because he was that, he was that he was, good. Just, yeah, he was playing you know, bully I, I ball think, since I year one. Probably, he was playing yeah, bully ball since probably, year one. But when yeah, he, no, he, he was, he was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But when he gets and and here's my other argument against LeBron and we'll close and we'll close this chapter here because I plan to have you back for another conversation. My other argument against LeBron is defensively. Okay, I mentioned the fundamental package. It's not all the way there. Has it gotten better? Of course it has. Okay, you got when you last 17 years. When you're in year 17, hey, you've done something right, and I'll never say he's done something wrong. But at the same time, I had a question about his fundamentals. 
I've also had a question about him defensively because defensively he can step up in spots. He can step up Mm. in spots, and he has. He just Mm. hasn't done it consistently in his 17 seasons. And I make the the comparison with people want to make the comparison between him and MJ. And I had a young fan, and you're going to love this one, I had a young fan ask me, name something that Michael Jordan has that LeBron doesn't. I said, let me take you back to 1988. There's a certain award we like to call Defensive Player of the Year, which MJ got in 88. Man, I still don't think people understand how great of a season that was. Yeah, Jordan, absolutely. So jo- Jordan, he, he won the All-Star MVP. He won the dunk contest. Okay, this man averaged 37, 37.5, I think, that year. 37.5 and 88. And this guy still won. He led the league in scoring. But still won the defensive player of the year. Who does that? And he led the league well, in steals. How can you be the leading scorer? And yes, well, how can you be the leading scorer, but yet still be the defensive player of the year? Who oh, has anybody done that besides a center? I don't even know. Besides if a center, center has done that. no. Was a league MVP and defensive player of the year not in the same season? No, not, not in not the even same season. League MVP. The 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 um he won the scoring title. He, he did. won the scoring title. He won the scoring and title. And even the player of the year in the same year. Who's it was, I don't, it was I don't kind think of a, no one's done that. It was a it was a kind of a quadruple play if you go back to eighty eight because MJ was the scoring champion, second of ten in a row yep. for all you LeBron fans. Listen carefully, second of ten in a row in terms of scoring titles. He led the league in steals. He was the All Star Game MVP. And he was the league MVP. Yeah, and this is that this was, is before the crazy. this is before the dynasty years. This was before right. the dynasty years. And remember, the Bulls won fifty games that year. They lost Pippen for part of the year due to a back injury. Well, uh, Pippen wasn't start, wasn't starting. He didn't start until the playoffs. But they lost him for part of that year due to a back injury. So people got to people got to remember MJ was sh- still shouldering the load while the Bulls were figuring out who to put in the lineup. I got to let you go, but tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Man, first of all, thank you for having me, Snowman. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, I you love all you. Can... I love you, brother. It's <laughs> always fun to have you on. Yes, sir. And you can follow me um, at Instagram or at Twitter at Mister Controversy Twenty One. Also. On Facebook, just look up Controversy Raphael and um, the three point conversion. Look us up. We got a three point conversion Facebook page. Also um, on all social media p- platforms at three point at the three point conversion is three P T C N V R S N. So at three point conversion, all you just put up the three point conversion and our YouTube channel as well. Make sure you follow the three point conversion.com. Man, please follow this man and his team and everything that, that he does. You have a three point attempt. You got a three point play. And then you got this man with the three point conversion. He is Mr. Controversy, Controversy <laughs> Raphael. I love you, brother. Thanks for coming on today. No problem. Got more for you folks. Sit back, relax, and strap it down. More after this.
tuned in to the Daily BS. Sports and culture combined into one. So I was listening to a friend's show this past Saturday night. A very, very dear friend. His name is Seth Cantor. And this is why this is one of the reasons why I'm hoping baseball comes back because I want to hear Seth Cantor call um, New York Boulders games. They were the Rockland Boulders. I listened to his very first game back in 2011. I caught his championship moment in 2014. But uh, in listening to the Grand Central Sports Hub featuring my buddy Seth Cantor, he gave me an idea, and I thought I'd share one of my bro- <laughs> one of my broadcasting adventures. And I got to thinking after listening to um, listening to Seth and his partner talk about some of the road trips that they've been on, I figured I'd share a couple of my own. Uh, in 2010, I was covering the Indiana Northwest Red Hawks in what would be up to date their final uh, baseball season, and that still gets on my nerves, but that's a story for another day. We went to Minnesota, and I had a chance to call some games in the Metrodome, and it was great, even though it was mostly empty. I didn't care. We had some fans come up, but in one particular instance, I'm sitting there, I'm broadcasting the game, I thought I had everything set up, and I'm thinking there's no way that a foul ball is going to reach where I am. I'm way upstairs. I'm way upstairs. And I'm thinking, okay, th- no way that's going to happen. Just just no way. Well, you know what? Ah! I was wrong. That's profiling. And profiling is wrong. So one of the players fouls the ball off. And I'm seeing all the foul balls. They go into the stands, and they're like a story and a half below me. And again, I'm thinking, no way it's going to reach all the way up here to the broadcast booth. Ah! I was dead wrong. And as soon as I said, I don't need a glove to one of the police officers that was up in the booth because they had a special day in the Metrodome, I said, there's no way. No way it's going to reach up here. Ha! Right on cue. Foul ball comes right up to me, and I'm tethered to the table. The cord from my headset, the cord from my microphone, and I'm tied up in them. I had two choices. Get out of the way or take a beaning. Not a beating, but a beaning. From this ball that's coming at, I'd say, about 100 miles an hour up to me in the booth. What? I said 100 miles an hour up to me in the booth. What? You heard what I said. So what do I do? I drop my headset and I bailed out of the way and I ducked. I don't want to get hit in the head with a baseball. Even though I fell in love with baseball, I don't want to get hit in the head. And as soon as I saw that ball coming... I'm thinking, you have got to be shaving me. Yeah. I will never in life make that assumption again, ever. Ever. That's one where I was with the Red Hawks. I'll give you a second one before we go on here. (laughs) I'll give you a second one. I was with the Red Hawks, and... I think we were playing Holy Cross. Yeah, we were playing Holy Cross. And I'm thinking we're going to go to South Bend. And at the time, they were known as the South Bend Silverhawks. Now they're known as the South Bend Cubs. I have no bleeping idea why they made that name change, knowing how much the Cubs ticked me off. And, of course, my wife just points at me, giving me the Mr. Point. Mr.? Watch your language. She just gave me she just gave me the motherly point. <laughs> but we were down in South Bend, and I'm thinking we're gonna play at um Silverhawk Stadium down in South Bend. 
And I'm ready for that. I'm ready to be in a warm booth. They said it was 50 degrees. They said it was 50 degrees. But nobody told me it was going to be that windy. So once again, I get another strike. Ah! Here's what happened. We play at this community park. And I'm so glad one of the attendants or two of the attendants of the park were on hand. And I didn't have an extension cord. So one of the attendants said, okay, I got you. He rolls an extension cord out to a plug that's like, y'all Y'all been in the park where you see those plugs like standing out and you can charge your phone or wherever there? Yeah, one of those. He rolls an extension cord up to me in the window, in the back window. I'm glad I kept my jacket on. And actually, it was not, I take that back. It was not Indiana Northwest. It was Roosevelt. It was the Roosevelt University Lakers where I was when this debacle happened. And I open this window, and it's the wind's right in my face. And there was a double header that I had to do. The back window was bad enough with the wind blowing at my back. And I'm thinking, no. But then again, I opened the front window and I had to turn off one of my microphones because the wind was blowing in it and no one could hear me. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I was so glad that we won both games. I got the hell out of there. And while I was packing up as fast as I can, with my fingers frozen to the bone, my pen was frozen. It wouldn't write for the second game. I had to get out of the booth in between games so I can get some sun. That didn't last long because the first game nearly went to extra innings. Thank God it didn't. I climbed out of the booth. My legs were frozen. Every part of me was frozen. I climbed downstairs. I get in the sun. And just as the sun was about to hit me, I get a signal. You have to go back in. We're about to start the second game. And I'm playing music at the time in between games. I'm live playing music in between games. And then I get the signal. We have to go to the second game. No, 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 no. I wound up doing it, did it, got out of there as fast as I could, and the whole 90-minute ride home, I'm thinking, You have got to be shaving me. Yeah, big-time error. So, with a situation like that, with a situation like that, <laughs> And I couldn't believe I got through it. But all I can think of while I was driving home was. So there's two broadcast stories for you. Two of many. And Lord, I have many. I'll spread them out throughout the course of the show, throughout the course of the days. That'll do it for this edition of the Daily BS. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you to my wonderful guests. And I want to thank you, the wonderful fans that have tuned in in the region, across the nation, and around the world. Want to sponsor this here program? Drop an email to snowman digital media at gmail.com. That's snowman digital media at gmail.com. And also, you can find us on snowman digital media.com for a great replay of this show. And don't forget, the podcast version thereof is available immediately after uh, after I get the heck out of here, which I'm about to do right now. Have a great afternoon. God bless. Remember to make your next move your best move. And always remember, if your dreams don't scare you, then they are not big enough. Dream big, do bigger. I am, and I hope you all are too. Until tomorrow, when I'm back at you again with another edition of the Daily BS, I'm signing off until 22 hours from now.
So long, everybody.